All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the second meeting of the Ask the Researcher MPA monitoring series. My name is Mike. Um, I'm a senior scientist at the Ocean Protection Council, um, and along with my colleague Tova Handelman, who's on uh, this meeting as well, we lead our work on coastal and ocean biodiversity, um, which includes marine protected areas. So I'll be facilitating this webinar um, along with Tova, uh, Steve Wurtz, and Becky Oda from the Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, and AJ with Strategic Earth. Um, and this webinar, just FYI, is being recorded and closed captioned so we can make the discussion available to anybody who's unable to um, attend live today. So if you have any questions or any difficulties or anything um, viewing Zoom or calling in, please just send a message to AJ, um, either in the chat or email or text. His contact info, I think, is gonna be posted in the chat right now. Um, and because we might have a lot of folks on this call, um, we ask that everybody stay muted until um, you're called upon by the facilitator. So during the Q&A, um, if you'd like to ask a question, please go ahead and raise your hand. The facilitators are gonna keep track of the hands raised and invite you to unmute yourself when it's your turn. Um, you'll also, of course, be able to post your questions in the chat. And to help identify yourself and other participants, um, we ask that you go ahead and rename yourself on Zoom. Um, so hopefully folks are pretty familiar with how to do that, but I'll just walk through just in case. Um, first, go ahead and click participants in the meeting controls, find your name, um, click on more and choose rename, and then go ahead and enter your full name um, first and last, and then who you are with um, identifier. And if you'd like to enable closed captioning on the Zoom, please go ahead and click CC in the meeting controls. Okay. So that's just some uh, logistic stuff. We're all really excited that you could join us here today. Um, we hope to see you at the following webinars as well. Just a little bit about the, the background for this webinar series. So this was designed really as an opportunity for interested members of the public to interact directly with researchers that are involved in California's MPA long-term monitoring. And really OPC and the department's goal in facilitating this eight part series is to support a really broad understanding of the research that's informing um, our MPA Decadal Management Review, which is happening next year. So last fall, um, we hosted four community meetings to inform the public about the Decadal Review um, and to really kind of dig into their perspectives and priorities on MPA management. And one consistent piece of feedback that we heard was folks really wanted to hear directly from the researchers to help them better understand the science that's informing the review, that's informing our monitoring and evaluation program. Um, so these webinars here, again, an eight part series, this is number three, uh, is intended to be responsive to that feedback. So before we begin, um, just wanna really quickly go over some meeting agreements that are gonna help promote a safe, respectful meeting for everybody. Um, please stay muted when you're not speaking, try to minimize distractions, uh, really listen for understanding. Um, during the discussion, please acknowledge, um, seek clarification of others' perspectives, uh, openly discuss issues with others who hold diverse views. And of course, as always, um, approach discussions from a place of diversity and inclusion. Keep your comments concise, um, focused on the topic at hand. Obviously, no personal attacks, no offensive language. Um, be nice. If you can't be nice at the Ask the Researcher MPA monitoring webinar, I don't know, man. Um, and finally, please just go ahead and connect with the facilitators to talk through any questions or concerns that, uh, that you might have. Um, so we're very fortunate today to be joined by Dr. Henry Rule um, from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute and Natalie Lowe from California Academy of Sciences. They will give a brief presentation on their work on ocean conditions observing systems um, in the MPA network. And after the presentation, we'll have time to hear questions from the audience. Um, and then following that Q&A, we'll also hear from Steve with CDFW who will provide a quick update on the MPA Decadal Management Review. Um, so now I'm very excited to go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Rule um, and Natalie for their presentation. Yes, thank you. Let me get my screen shared here. And so hopefully that's coming through okay. All right, so yeah, so thanks so much uh, to the organizers today uh, who are also, um, uh, our sponsors for this project. And so uh, we're excited to talk about what we've been doing. And thanks also to the project team and the many folks in the MPA program who've uh, helped contribute to the work you'll see today. 
And so let's see here, this is going. And so, yeah, the, uh, I'll give a little bit of introduction and background to our work, you know, the, the things that help set us up to, to where we are today and the, go through the, the details of the project. So that we often refer to this as the California IUS MPA project. And I'll, I'll talk about more, more about what that means, but um, the project ob objectives included data integration, developing a California MPA dashboard and this includes concepts around uh, MPA connectivity, ecological indicators, climate variation, and climate change. And so importantly, our work uh, not only took part uh, as part of this uh, MPA effort in the state of California, but it also was uh, operated in the context of the Integrated Ocean Observing System of the United States. And there's two regional associations of, of IUS, this Integrated Ocean Observing System in California, the Southern California Coastal Ocean Observing System and the Central and Northern California Ocean Observing System where I work. And so these uh, regional associations operate across four strategies really that one is the first is to engage with marine stakeholders to, stakeholders to understand what information is needed and how we might go about getting it. Uh, we also do a lot of ocean observing, and so this means collecting uh, physical, biogeochemical, and biological observations from shore stations, buoys, robotic ocean-going gliders, and more, and then putting this data into a data management structure that's publicly accessible, and then developing uh, information products from that data, and so this includes ocean models, which are similar to the kinds of ocean rather weather forecast models that you'll all be familiar with. Um, but these are, these are in this case for the ocean, so we can forecast conditions in the ocean, um, as well as make other data uh, products, data information products available. And you'll hear about more of those uh, today. And we do this through a sort of a process of continuous improvement, which you see on the right there, sort of a, a cycle of um, getting feedback. And that's part of what we're doing today. And so the project team included, again, those from the Central and Northern California Ocean Observing System. And Natalie Lowe uh, worked as part of our team. She's now at the Cal Academy, as was mentioned, and she'll, she'll talk a little bit more uh, in a bit. And we also had folks from the Southern California team and Axiom Data Science as one of our data management partners in, in uh, our program, as well as uh, Chris Edwards and Patrick Drake, also from the University of California, Santa Cruz. And so one of the things I wanted to start with in terms of concepts was the sort of interplay between weather, climate variability, and climate change. And so, you know, the MPA program now has, um, in some cases, a couple of decades of data, depending on the series we're talking about. But we're now bridging between what is commonly referred to as weather in terms of the, you know, when you go out and make an observation on any given day, you're in the sort of framework of weather. But as these observations build over time, you bridge into uh, variability and then uh, eventually change. And one of the common uh, things that we refer to in terms of climate uh, is with the El Nino Southern Oscillation or El Nino and La Nina that influence our region. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But just to think about what climate variability and change mean. So here's a time series of uh, temperature globally from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And we can just look at the last uh, a couple of decades of data is this breakout on the right hand side of the screen there. And what you're looking at there is yearly data of temperature where the variability is about an order of magnitude higher than the progressive um, climate change rate. And so disentangling these two signals is challenging. It's challenging in the ocean as well. And so this is just something to keep in mind as we look at uh, uh, information from the program and from our project. And so one of the key ways that the atmosphere connects with the ocean in our region is through upwelling. And so the winds running from the northwest along our coast, so headed in the south, uh, southeast direction <clears throat> along our coast, drive this process called upwelling, which brings nutrient-rich, cooler water to the surface near the coast. And then that drives phytoplankton production, zooplankton, and goes on up in the food web uh, through to fishes and, and even more. And so over longer and uh, larger timescales, and this really, um, it co-varies with things like El Nino, and it really drives coastal ecosystem change in our region. So it's an important process to bear in mind. <clears throat> and so another concept is this concept of seascapes. And so as conditions change, uh, they can be sort of classified into a number of different uh, categories, if you like. And so that there's a table on the right-hand side describing many of them. 
globally in a map of seascapes for the world here on the left side. And these seascapes can be generated using information from satellites, <laughs> including sea surface temperature, uh, salinity, and also things like chlorophyll, which chlorophyll, as many of you will appreciate, is an indicator of um, production in the ocean and the amount of food availability in the ocean. And so as we generate longer time series of where these seascapes are, what the, what the extent of them is, <clears throat> and how they change over time, we build a, a situation going from snapshot <laughs> Excuse me. And through it to a time series of understanding um, variability and change. And so we see one of the seascapes in our region, not surprisingly, is tropical, subtropical upwelling. <clears throat> and we'll come back to how these things change a little bit later. And so these, these concepts that you've heard about um, helped frame the thinking for our project. There's a series of workshops and reports and papers <clears throat> that have helped guide this for us. Uh, over time, as well as the uh, detailed work of the program itself uh, in, in framing action plans and other things. And so our questions for our project at high level were how can changes in MPA condition be attributable to MPA management and or other phenomena such as regional climate change? And how can data from various investigators, locations, habitats, and methods be integrated to produce robust assessments of change? <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> and key indicators that are useful for MPA management. And so one of the key things that we worked on in the project is the integration of data into common time and space domains. And so this allows for <clears throat> more ready analysis of data. And so here we have some tables of the kinds of data that we've been working with and the years in which those data are available. And one of the key things that we did in this work is to, <clears throat> excuse me, um, put, the, put this into interoperable formats that are machine readable and then with metadata that allows for e easier onward use of this data in the future. So this adds to the repeat, repeat, repeatability of analyses and the robustness of analyses. And so some of the kinds of data that we worked with include climate indicators like those that are indicative of El Nino or other things, <clears throat> upwelling, sea surface temperature, the amount of food uh, in, in the water column in terms of net primary productivity, as well as water clarity and wave energy. And also biogeochemistry in terms of um, indicators of ocean acidification, as well as um, perhaps most importantly, data from the monitoring program itself across several habitats. And so this included information from the California Collaborative uh, Fisheries Research Program, CCFRP, the Multi-Agency Intertidal Network, so marine, and the Partnership for Interdisciplinary Studies uh, of, of Coastal Oceans, so PISCO. And so this includes, you know, rocky intertidal areas, kelp habitats, uh, fish and kelp and invertebrates. And there's also data from the uh, uh, Reef Check California Diver Survey Program, as well as information from things like satellite data on kelp canopy cover and biomass and the seascapes I've mentioned, <clears throat> as well as uh, an indicator of harmful algal bloom risk. So many of you will appreciate that harmful algal blooms can be, uh, they produce toxins and uh, these can be harmful to both marine life and humans. And so we took all this data and put it into a format that's again, readily uh, analyzable and so on. And we put it into this MPA dashboard framework, which you'll see a demo of in a bit. But this dashboard has data for now 122 MPAs across California. And it, you know, you, you can go in and visualize data, you can download data, but really the, the, it's this um, integrative aspect that goes across visualizing from climate through to, to physical conditions through to the biological and ecosystem conditions. And you can do this in various ways, depend, not, not, not uh, um, all the data is available everywhere all the time, but we, we, we show what's available. And this can be um, a really nice way to just get a quick feel for how things might be changing in, in, in different ways. And so there's other uh, aspects too that you'll hear about in a moment. And so one of the, the data sets that we worked with <coughs> Uh, generated as part of our project is data on MPA connectivity. And so I think many of you all appreciate that the MPA program was established in part with uh, understanding uh, of the fact that M when you establish an MPA, 
this can be a sort of a source of, of marine life for other areas of the coast that are not MPAs. Uh, and so the spacing and sizing of these things uh, wants to keep in mind the connectivity of them. <clears throat> and so to look at this, in our project, we used uh, started with what's called the West Coast Ocean Forecast System. And the, the domain of that model uh, is shown on the left-hand side of your screen running from well into British Columbia down through Baja, Mexico. <clears throat> and this produces forecasts of things like ocean currents. And so uh, we use this information and built inside of this model high resolution, high resolution nests. And what this means is uh, high resolution estimates of where um, currents are taking, uh, you know, perhaps uh, larval fish or, or other plankton. And we focused on the Monterey Bay area where we have a resolution of about 160 meters, which is per pixel of the model, which is very high resolution. And on the right side of your screen, you can see a, a, a simulation where we release um, particles, sort of theoretical particles representing um, marine life in the model. So like, for example, fish larvae and where they, we can see where they might go over a number of days and you can see the distribution. Um, leaving a Monterey Bay, uh, basically down by Pacific Grove, um, you can see particles leaving that area and where they might be going over a period of days. And this then allows us to answer questions such as, <clears throat> how does the distance and larval contribution between a source MPA and sink MPA influence the ecosystem response inside the sink MPA? And then how does the level of connectivity and larval supply from an MPA to out areas outside of the MPAs uh, affect fisheries? And so to drill down in this a little bit more, <clears throat> I want to remind you that with these particles, we can assign different behaviors to them that are similar to what you might find with marine life, meaning that the particles can have different larval durations and so the different lifetimes uh, uh, when they're in this um, planktonic stage of being carried by the currents. They can have different behavior in terms of remaining in the surface or vertically migrating and so on. And we can then, um, simulate the sort of life histories of crabs and uh, fish and other things. <clears throat> and so looking at the center of your screen there, you'll see that some of the MPAs in the Monterey Bay area in the blue, and then we have what are called, you might think of them as settling areas or sinks. They're numbered along the coast there, one through 27. And we can then estimate how particles are moving from the MPAs into these other areas. And so on the right side of your screen, we have a graph that illustrates the quantification of that. So on the bottom, you'll see the MPA abbreviations release MPAs. And so, and those are shown there on the screen as well. And on the vertical ax axis of that uh, plot, we see the settling cell the location along the coast where the, the particles or, or larvae might be settling. And this is a um, estimate over a, a few days, about a week. <clears throat> and then we can extend that out to a longer period and we can see that um, the MPA, the way this is working across all the scenarios uh, that we've looked at, the nearshore cells received model larvae from at least one of the MPA locations within the greater Monterey Bay area. And this is sort of an indication that the spacing and, and functioning of the MPAs in terms of connectivity is, is actually looking uh, rather good. And so this, this sort of life, lifetime that you're seeing here is common for many fish and, and crabs and, and other things. And so. So onward to this seascapes concept. And so uh, again, this, this is a way that we can understand how things like climate variation and other things might be having broad scale impacts and changing the conditions observed at any given MPA or bioregion for the state for that matter. So the bioregions being you know, the Northern uh, Central and Southern California bioregions and the Southern California one we can break into being the onshore coastal ones as well as the ones associated with the um, Channel Islands. And so on this figure here on the right side, you can see years going from 2003 to, to through 2021 and across the bottom there. And on the uh, vertical axis, we have the MPAs going up and down the coast from north to south as we go from top to bottom. And one of the things that pops out immediately when you look at this is these blue seascape category 17, which is associated with more warm conditions and how this warm conditions kind of penetrated up, up the coast during the 2015-16 period. And this was associated with something that's uh, often referred to as the warm blob or the blob, which was a, marine, was a large scale marine heat wave around, around that time. <clears throat> and the other thing you can sort of take away from this pretty quickly is that that heat wave then eventually abated 
uh, although there are traces of it in later years, but the conditions overall have remained somewhat similar throughout the period, apart from this major variation. And then one of the other main takeaways from this in, in comparing the presence of these uh, specific types of ocean conditions at MPAs is that they are correlated with the kelp biomass. And so we know that the variation of kelp in the state has been a real uh, challenge to understand. But these seascapes do correlate, uh, specific seascapes, um, you know, 11 and 15, for example, uh, um, do have this sort of uh, corresponding to higher versus lower correlations with, with the presence. So that some conditions are favorable, appear to be favorable for kelp, for example, cooler nutrient rich waters versus uh, warmer, less nutrient rich waters being less favorable for kelp. And so this is also being corroborated by other studies through Tom Bell um, and others uh, uh, in the region, working in the region. And so, Looking again at um, integrated, assess integrated assessments, and so what this means is taking data from different, um, several different frames and bringing them together to look across climate and more specific locations. And so here we have data from the um, multivariate ocean climate index, so M MOSI or MOKI as some people refer to it. And this can help us understand how conditions have changed over time from basin scales to large scales down to the bioregion scale. And so that black line that you see running through each of these panels is, uh, is all the same values. That's the, an indicator of um, El Nino in the region. And then each of those three panels is going from Northern California, Central and Southern. And this is, um, and the, 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 the colors is the, the Moki indicator for each of those bioregions where the, the red is associated with more El Nino and warmer conditions and the blue more La Nina and cooler conditions. And you can see that there are very similar patterns, but there, there are tighter correlations between the um, Northern California area and the, the more global scale patterns than we see in the South. All of the patterns are, again, are generally uh, fairly similar. And so we can drill down even more and we can look at how the, the Moki climate variation there at the top of this panel then relates to upwelling, sea surface temperature, productivity and water clarity, wave height and power, uh, and kelp cover, for example, how this relates at the scale of bioregions, but we also have undertaken, developed these series for dozens of specific MPAs. <clears throat> and so this then allows us to ask the question, um, how has the similarity of oceanographic conditions in individual MPAs changed over time relative to the bioregion? And one of the ways that we looked at this is uh, here on the, uh, the right-hand side where the shading uh, the, the, the darker the shading in that gray, the more different that MPA is to the bioregion within which it sits. And so they're organized into the bioregions, as you can see there, with specific MPAs. And we can see, for example, in the central coast, the Point Sur uh, MPA is a little bit looking at tending to be a little bit more different than some of the MPAs nearby it in terms of how conditions are changing over time. And we can see uh, as, as we go from um, left to right on this graph is, is through time, so running from about um, 2000 to 2021, <clears throat> this helps highlight where conditions might be un unusual. And this can be uh, very useful for when you're wanting to interpret other data from other programs in these, at these same locations uh, as to why conditions might be the way uh, they have been found to be um, depending on the observing program. And so um, moving towards the end here, so the, the um, final thing we'll, we looked at in the project had to do with climate change. And so we wanted to understand the climate change risk for MPAs. <coughs> Excuse me. And so we used a, a model output that's been downscaled for the, the California coastline uh, using the scenarios of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, specifically the business as usual scenario that runs out until 2100. And so this builds a picture of what um, ocean condition, conditions might be like uh, under climate change. And so we looked at sea surface temperature, oxygen, chlorophyll, stratification. So this is how mixed the ocean is in a sense and, and upwelling uh, as we've discussed. And we developed ranks of MPA. So in terms of the ones that change the most, and you can think of those as maybe perhaps being most at risk from climate change, 
through to those that change the least. And you can think of those as being refugia, so places where there might be a, a somewhat of a refuge from climate change. And the figure that you see there shows the um, areas of lowest change shaded by red. And you can see where these overlap with MPAs as well as, as other areas along the state coast. And, um, and you can see which MPAs uh, happen to be overlapping. They're listed there in the, in the figures. And this can help um, guide any thinking about um, designation of MPAs in the future in which, uh, and how they relate to how climate might um, change in the future. And so this, although this is uh, specifically uh, quantifying up to 2100, we can look at shorter scale time um, changes in climate as well. And it's also important to point out that although there are differences up and down the coast, depending on the shape of the, the, the coast and, uh, and other factors, the overall trend, of course, uh, as one might expect, is for consistent warming and other things up and down the coast. The degree to which this happens is um, not the same. But the, the fundamentally, the, there's no place along the coast that is expected to be fully shielded from climate change um, uh, in one, one sense or another. And so just a little bit more about um, some work we've been doing that's relevant quickly so that the uh, way in which we package information sort of comes into three categories. So we have things like infographics that we work with, uh, National Marine Sanctuaries uh, drives a lot of this work. And so these are relatively straightforward ways to view information. And curated data views is another way and so that we'll be seeing an example in a moment. Uh, so this is a little bit more expert facing uh, uh, framework and so that the, a little bit more detailed information and, and information put together uh, in various customized ways. And then there are these data portals. And so these data portals uh, are sort of the more full whack experience where you have large catalogs of information that can be vis visualized together in a myriad of different ways. Um, and so we have just recently launched a new statewide portal system for California that has uh, thousands of data sets in it. And there's over a thousand that are feeding data in real time across the coast. And then many more that are um, in, in some sort of catalog format as well. And so there's lots of ways to work with that information. And you can do some programming uh, uh, in that area as well. So you can use what's called the research workspace that sort of sits behind the portal and access the information using computer code uh, and do that where the data sits rather than downloading it which is a really nice feature. And in fact, how some of the data that we used in our uh, data dashboard was, was developed using this research workspace. Uh, here's a quick example of, of some of the data from the program being visualized in our data portal. You can go in there and have a quick view of the data in terms of how it fits in time series and see if it's something you might wanna work with uh, more closely later. I also wanted to highlight that some of the, these papers here are from an oceanography magazine volume that was published recently that is part of the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network and is really centered around the National Marine Sanctuary framework. But these National Marine Sanctuaries are a form of mixed use marine protected area. So there's some relevant uh, content in these papers that might be of interest for the audience. And then finally, just acknowledging the many folks who have helped contribute to this. We had lots of discussions with people working in the program and other experts. And so we really appreciate all the time that went into that. And so with that, I'll stop and hand over to Natalie. All right. So I'm just going to give like a general quick look at um, the MPA dashboard, which, um, as Henry mentioned, was kind of developed to streamline access to MPA data and like get this relevant data for MPAs from a variety of different sources, basically into one place, have it summarized and processed for the time scales and the spatial scales that are relevant to how researchers and MPAs think about MPAs. So this is the dashboard. You can find it at MPA dashboard.calus.org. Um, um, and the, you know, here you can see the, the, the map of the California coasts with, um, with MPAs highlighted and MPAs can be selected from the, the drop-down menu, or you can kind of go in there, look at where different groups um, have their long-term monitoring sites, um, pick an MPA from by clicking it on it um, directly. 
And then you pull up a bunch of variables, um, both ecological and environmental variables that, that exist for that site. So for example, you know, here we have, we can throw on a bunch of um, different environmental variables and it will start to pull up these plots of what that looks like um, at this site. You can put on, you know, go look at um, data from CCFRP, looking at fish. Um, yeah, so, so we can, you know, put in a bunch of these environmental variables and it, it will start to generate these sequences of plots. Um, and you can see the, the black line is the, the mean for the MPA and with, with, with some background, this is the range for different bioregions and you can toggle on and off ranges or the means for the different general bioregions um, to look at reference, uh, you know, changes in, in um, yeah, so that will take a little while to pull, but so they will replot that. And then you can also change and, 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 and alter the time series to just look at the data. So um, basically this allows people to find and visualize data that are available for the MPAs without having to dig through all the different sources and process data themselves. Um, and then more importantly, these data can be downloaded um, by different sites. So if you pick that, um, yeah, so those data can be pulled up and downloaded. Um, so this is basically trying to be like a place where you can access all these relevant data. Um, so that this is you know, just for the MPA time series data, but as Henry mentioned, there are also other um, integrated model outputs for different variables that don't necessarily come in linear time series. So Henry talked about um, the seascape classifications that we can use to understand variation and change. And so this is gonna take a little while to pull up, but um, there's you know, a way to visualize those seascapes, both in terms of spatial maps, which is loading, it's a little bit large, but, um, and then also by time series. So I'm gonna wait for this to come up. And these will map seascapes for different, let's try that again. Um, these will map seascapes for different time periods. But we can also plot them by different time, yeah, time series and by different uh, bioregions. So these will pull up some of the, the similar figures to what Henry showed in the, yeah, okay. So this, this it pulls up by map. Um, you can plot that by individual MPAs and look at time series of seascapes um, over the time that you define and then also look at it by bioregion. So being able to compare them um, very similarly, there's you, we can visualize the future projections of climate variables. Um, again, in terms of spatial maps across the California um, ocean. So this will pull up data coming out of the the California uh, or the California current climate ROMS model, both as spatial maps but also being able to compare that change um, in different MPAs across all of them or by bioregion. And then finally, there's also, we can also visualize and, and access the outputs of the uh, connectivity modeling that Henry was mentioning before um, with, from the, uh, um, from the models coming out of Chris Edwards team at UCSC. So both being able to look at these connectivity matrices um, under different kinds of larval 
behaviors and durations and, and um, model, and as well as looking at dispersal maps for different MPAs. So yeah, so this is kind of a one place to look at a whole bunch of different data related to MPAs. And finally, we do have all the documentation for, for you know, the underlying data and things and processes that, that went into that. So um, yeah, that's a, a very brief, brief tour of the dashboard, but it's accessible and live at mpa-dashboard.calus.org. And I will, with that, I will kind of pass it back to, I guess, for questions or. Yeah, thank you um, so much, Dr. Lowe and Dr. Rule. Um, really great presentation. I think just, you know, for somebody like myself, um, who's been, you know, even tracking, even me tracking this project really closely, just seeing everything kind of laid out in one cohesive, compelling story like that is, um, is really awesome. So let's move on to questions. Um, we've got just a little under 20 minutes um, to answer audience questions. So uh, obviously, please keep your questions relevant to the topics at hand, so specifically relevant to um, what Dr. Lowe and Dr. Rule just presented, uh, and we're hoping to leave space for everyone who wants to speak to have a chance to speak. Um, so please go ahead and raise your hand uh, or press star six if you're joining via phone. One of the facilitators will call on you uh, when it's your turn. You're also, of course, welcome to ask questions in the chat, um, and we will include those in the queue of questions for Dr. Rule and Dr. Lowe. Um, one chat question per person as time allows, please. And also uh, department staff on the call will take lead on answering management questions as they arise. Um, I'll do my best to take note when those responses appear. We might not get to all of your questions today. Um, so we do strongly encourage you all to review the recording, um, review also the snapshot report or the full report for this project that's available on OPC um, and the department's websites and follow up by sending any outstanding questions to the Decadal Management Review email address, which I know AJ is gonna post um, right now. Okay, so let's move on to questions. Um, seeing a few pop up here. So we have a recommendation from Cindy Dawson. It would be helpful to have reef check sites as a layer on the map, um, like PSCO and CCFRP. Good recommendation, thank you, Cindy. Um, any other? Questions coming up, I'm not seeing any. Um, I've got some questions, Dr. Rule and Dr. Lowe, if you'll, uh, if you'll indulge, indulge me. So maybe starting, I've got some technical and some that are more high level. So maybe I'll start with, um, with a technical question. So that, that slide with the seascape categories that you presented, it looked like it showed the most change during those marine heat wave years in Southern California. Um, Obviously, we all know that that the marine heat wave also had devastating effects on the the north coast. Really, kind of transformed those ecosystems. So, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to exactly what those seascape categories represent and why it seems like the um, the greatest magnitude of change, at least on that graph, was was found in um, Southern California NPAs. Yeah, that's a great question. So that the um... 17 there, I believe, is a uh, subtropical, more tropical uh, seascape. And um, they do have some overlap. And one of the things that's ongoing is trying to develop an understanding of what goes along with each of these seascapes and the, the, the work to describe how kelp biomass seems to be related to these as one of those pieces. But there's other features that we're trying to understand better. And that includes. Uh, for example, how different seascapes are related to like forage fish abundance. And so many folks will know the story um, of how anchovies and sardines sometimes have opposing variations on, on the coast, and that's been related to El Nino. And of course, these, these things are related. And so there's still work to try and understand that, but the, the fundamental thing here is, is to do with, uh, is sort of self-evident in the sense that these these seascapes can pick up change. And, and one of the things that came across to me when I was doing this, we did a little bit of analysis to understand uh, each MPA, like, so does the seascape see the same kind of variation as when we look at the variation specifically across the, the upwelling, the temperature, the salinity, 
and so on. And so the seascapes were corresponding very well. It's not a surprise because that, although they're doing it from satellite um, uh, and some of the data sets that we looked at are the same, we were able to sort of recreate the seascape, um, if you like, from other components of data. And so this added a lot of confidence for us in that the seascapes that we're seeing at the level MPAs was actually informative of real change. And so, um, and we can go back into the table uh, that we have. Um, there's a table that describes the seascapes as well in terms of what, the, what their character is, um, in terms of some of them relate to more saline or less saline conditions, some relate to upwelling, some relate to more nutrients being available. And so they're really different combinations of things, but they're distinct enough that they can sort of be classified into these, these bins, if you like. Uh, and so uh, the, the, and the, I guess to, to your question specifically about, about why the, the one was particularly visible, I think, you know, there's other categories like 14 where that's probably also visible. It's less visible in this figure, but 14 also seemed to have varied a bit like that uh, all the way up and down the coast um, and sort of an in inverse way to the 17. But um, the Southern California bite is, does behave a little bit more differently than the rest of the coastline. And this is not a surprise, and it's one of the reasons why the bioregions were set up the way they are. But the, the, the marine heat wave in particular seemed to sort of break down that boundary in a sense, um, perhaps in, in relation to sort of relaxed wind conditions and other things. But yeah. Great. Yeah, thank you. That, that really helps. Um, Looks like we had a question from Nicole, but Dr. Lowe has responded in the chat. Um, maybe I'll just see if you have anything to add um, verbally, Dr. Lowe. So Nicole had said, such a cool resource. Um, I, I totally agree with that. How does this MPA dashboard relate to or integrate with other MPA data resources? So like the data one portal where all the long-term monitoring data and baseline data is now available. Um, Marine BIOS, which is hosted by the department, et cetera. Um, is this dashboard that you've created the primary one to point people to with MPA data questions? Yeah, I can add to what I've said. So um, the the data that we've processed, you know, a lot of the, the work that went into this is actually kind of on the back end in processing those data and getting them into consistent formats. Um, and so those data are actually available on the OPC data one node. Um, as part of this project um, in both annual and, and um, monthly summaries. And the data that we have from the other ecological monitoring groups, such as CCFRP, Pisco, Marine, they come from the, the data that those groups have put on data one. And we have these processing scripts that take them off, process them and then have them in things. So there, there is a data stream that is replicable and can be updated as they update their data. And we would hope that this would be a good place to point people to look for MPA data as a first stop. Um, we've also, you know, there's a lot of this underlying data that are processed in the ways that we think are most useful, but we have also had, we've also taken that data on the back end and processed it for specific groups um, in different ways. So I think this is this would be the first st stop. But if there's there's like a data set that looks like oh well you have it in this form, but maybe we went in a slightly different form. That's something that that we can also provide. And we've done similar sorts of summaries for the the National Marine Sanctuaries folks, which are not MPAs, but um, you know the underlying data are the same and can be processed in slightly different ways. So that, yeah, I hope that answers that question. That's great, thank you. Um, we have a question from Jamie here. Um, thank you so much for your work and your presentation. What are some of the primary ways that you can foresee this portal impacting adaptive management? And maybe I'll add on to that question and say, you know, can you maybe answer that from the perspective of obviously decision makers um, who are you know, making decisions about MPAs and other coastal and ocean resources, but also um, interested stakeholders. Yeah, so um, I think the thing that we all want uh, is to try and have a common understanding. And so you know, we, we developed this, um, the data sets that underpin it 
you know, there are, we put them into the common time and space domain. So they're like, we have a better idea of that, how comparable they are, if you like, um, you know, that, that when we're looking at data collected on a weekly basis, that it's weekly throughout all the data or on a monthly basis or on an annual basis. And so um, that stuff is all sort of baked into the portal as it is, uh, or the, the dashboard. And the other, there's another piece of it is that, you know, there's been this QA, QC process and adding metadata and all, all happening as data goes into data one, for example, and then we are, we're fetching information from data one and then modifying it um, or, or di redigesting it, if you like, for the, the, the portal, for the dashboard framework. And then, so when people go to it, it's the scientists and anyone that goes to that place sees the same thing. And so that it builds that sort of common understanding of, uh, of, of how things you know, might be changing or not. And that to me is one of the most powerful things in, in terms of um, having that information available. And it's, we wanna make it digestible in different ways. So that's what you can change the features of the dashboard to, to suit your interest, as well as the, the other portal that I was showing, there's other ways to, to visualize. And so that it's you know, giving, empowering people with the information that they need to make decisions and you know, the, the values that you then add on top of that have to do with you know sustainability uh, versus growing the blue economy and things like that. But I think it's the scientists and, and managers and, and and the rest that are looking for the for that um, common understanding. So yeah, and so maybe a quick follow up on that. Um, you know, I think one of the strengths of this project is that it really allows resource managers to place some of the MPA monitoring biological results in the context of ocean conditions, right? And especially in the context of changing ocean conditions. And so I think, you know, as we look at the, the long-term monitoring results kind of across the board, um, there's some there's some clear patterns that emerge, um, especially regionally, some, some statewide patterns, but in a lot of cases, the results are very nuanced, right? And so the, the signal that we're seeing, like how well, quote unquote, the MPAs are, are performing depends on a ton of different factors. So. Have you had any conversations with your fellow um, MPA monitoring PIs about, you know, maybe they're seeing something that surprises them a little bit or is not what you'd expect based on kind of, if you were just sort of thinking about the classic model of recovery inside versus outside MPAs where your analysis has sort of been able to, to put that in context to help interpret any of those, um, any of those results? I think the one that comes to mind most is the situation with kelp. So we, you know, thinking back through um, the last few years, there's been lots of great research to try and understand what's happening with kelp with in relation to um, sea star wasting disease and the abundance of urchins uh, and other things um, and temperature and nutrient availability. And one of the things that came across in our work and in others is this, uh, the temperature and, and nutrients really seems to be a consistent, and as it relates to the seascapes as well, really seems to be consistent. And so far, um, it might represent a little bit of an evolution. And I think many folks who follow the abundance of kelp will know that in 2021 uh, and 22, like in the last year or so, there's been a little bit of re resurgence in kelp in the north. Um, and this has uh, might be related to or is at least coincident with some cooler waters that have been happening with La Nina that we've experienced now for, there's been almost two years of La Nina. It's gonna probably persist through the rest of this year. Uh, and it might be helping the, the kelp recovery a little bit. Um, and so that's one of the sort of pleasant surprises one might say, uh, and appears to be fairly consistent. <clears throat> and as you, as you alluded to, there's two things can be true is that one is that these, these large scale fundamental changes, the warm blob being an example, you know, if you're working in marine science on the West coast, the warm blob was evident almost everywhere. Very, you know, it's like, how could you miss it? Um, and it changed, you know, it relates to weather that we were having as well. Uh, and, but, you know, when you drill down in the details, it, you know, when you look at specific fish species at a specific place, things get, do get more complicated. Um, but somewhere uh, in the middle, there is, uh, 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 and these on discussions that are ongoing right now with the, the decadal assessment as to what is the bigger picture. And, and there's some wonderful indications that, uh, that, that, you know, for example, about connectivity that I mentioned that the, the 
um, design seems to be working in many ways. And then there's the, you know, some, um, some eventual uh, gray areas. And so those things are still being worked through, but um, yeah, there's lots of pretty obvious things like the, the kelp being one of them, I think. And it's being uh, corroborated by other work as well, which is a key part of the scientific process. Yeah, definitely um, an issue that's near and dear to my heart and uh, something that's been really interesting to track over the last few years. Um, definitely a uh, story is not over on, on that, I think. So thanks for those comments. We've got a question from Julian. Um, in what ways would you like to see this dashboard expand? And are there any data sets where you feel the portal is, um, is lacking? So any gaps that you might want to address moving forward? Yeah, for sure. Um, and so there are other uh, monitoring, monitoring data sets from the program that we've not yet included. Some of them are uh, either smaller or more complicated to represent in that framework. But we do want to continue the work to uh, look at how to include them. Uh, and our direction for this it also entrains the National Marine Sanctuary context. And so uh, as well as other things like potentially areas of offshore and wind management. Um, so we want to be mindful of all of these things as we're developing data uh, or visualizations going forward. But um, you know, there's data from uh, Sandy Beaches from estuaries that's still uh, sort of coming together, <clears throat> and uh, as well as deep areas. One of my personal research interests is in deep ocean ecology, and so we would eventually like to see some of that uh, uh, information available there as well. Um, and so that, that'll be coming uh, you know, over the course of the, the years. And so I think probably the right time scale to sort of issue updates for the, the might be on an annual basis. Um, and we have just recently, I don't know, in the past month or so, updated some of the content in the portal to update, include um, 2021 data from uh, the environmental side. We haven't yet gotten uh, some of the MPA monitoring data from 2021 in there just yet, but that can come soon. And one of the nice things is, you know, the hard work that Natalie uh, and others have done to have this code that can digest data, uh, you know, um, in a structured way, in a repeatable way, and makes it much easier for us going forward to do that uh, on an iterative basis. Cool, cool, thank you. Um, question from Nicole, uh, you mentioned infographics as a way to share information. Have <clears throat> infographics related to this project already been developed um, or was that a future goal? And, and one thing that we can point out, I think maybe AJ, you can drop the link in the chat is that, um, We've worked with all the PIs, OPC and the department have worked with all the PIs to develop little snapshot reports, um, summarizing many of the major findings. So those are nice little um, sort of bite-sized infographic style uh, summaries that, um, that are useful, I think, for, for outreach and education regarding this stuff. But uh, Henry or Natalie, any, any additional um, infographics that have been developed or are in the works? Yeah, not specific for the MPA program, um, but but indeed for the National Marine Sanctuary framework. Now, um, we, we could, we could we're happy to discuss how that might be useful. And so, you know, one of the nice things again is that the, many of the data sets that, that underpin them are the same. And so just recently we've helped uh, with the, what's called a condition report from the National Marine Sanctuary that included um, some data from Pisco, for example, and from Reef Check. Uh, and that was, um, you know, doing that work was facilitated in part by the fact that these data sets were integrated in, in a state where we were able to work with them fairly um, uh, efficiently. And so uh, whether it's infographics or other things that, that can, um, it's now an easier thing to do. Uh, so that the, the thing that we always try and think about when we invest time and effort into, you know, new products is you know who's the customer it's got to be a specific there's got to be a specific reason for doing it that because without that it becomes difficult to have the requirement setting um and there is of course some sometimes when we want to showcase what we think might be useful um but you know we're happy to have discussions about specific demographic uh drivers if they're of interest to folks in the audience so that's great 
Thank you. Um, I think just noting the time, I'm gonna move us along. So thanks everyone for all of your great questions. That was a really fascinating discussion. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Steve Wirtz, who will give us a brief update on the Decadal Management Review. Great, thanks Mike. And once again, thanks, thanks Henry and Natalie and crew for that amazing uh, overview of technologies and the sources of information that can help inform uh, California's uh, resources of its marine, its marine resources. It's amazing. So over the next couple of slides, I just want to briefly recap why we're having this decadal management review, the components that will go into the report and ways you can be engaged. Uh, as you may recall, uh, the planning process for California's network took place sequentially across four coastal regions from 2004 to 2012, resulting in 124 uh, marine protected areas and 14 special closures. Once California achieved that amazing goal, uh, the department developed or updated its master plan for marine protected areas from a siting and planning document to be a more forward-looking management document. And two key outcomes from that particular document was one, we established a 10-year management review cycle from the date or the year that the network was completed. And that was basically based on the life history and biology of the resources along the California coastline. And it was uh, administratively more feasible to do a comprehensive report every 10 years. The other key point that came out of the report or the master plan was a uh, monitoring uh, an MPA management program, which is composed of four pillars that you may be familiar with, and that's research and monitoring, outreach and education, policy and permitting, and enforcement and compliance. Uh, those are the pillars for the program. So now that we're in 2022, the department's been working with Ocean Detection Council, a variety of stakeholders and researchers to pull information together to inform how the network is functioning and it was working as it was designed. And it was encouraging to see some of that brief modeling stuff that uh, the particles that Henry spoke about uh, to see the transport of the larvae from source sites to MPA sites. That's hopefully we're gonna hear more about that in the coming months. Um, but essentially all of the uh, presentations that are set up for this, this series of workshops, ask the researcher, that information is going to be integrated into a report that we're developing for the Fishing Game Commission. The report's going to be developed uh, and released in January of 2023 for the public, and the commission will receive it in February. At that time, the commission will uh, just formally receive it, probably get an update from the department about the intricacies of the report, and then moving into March, there'll be a full discussion about the adaptive management recommendations and any other aspect of the report that the commission is interested in. And that'll probably roll over into April of 2023, where the commission will probably give the department some directions and next steps moving forward. Um, so the report itself will include this research and monitoring data you've been hearing about. And if you haven't seen the other webinars, the previous two, I recommend you check them out once they're available. Uh, we've been working with California Native American tribes uh, to get a better understanding of traditional ecological knowledge and tribal perspective on MPAs and how T TEK can inform management. Uh, we've been working with people like you and other ocean interest groups to inform us about uh, the management program. Uh, there's each one of our pillars, we've got quite a wide range of people who are interested in providing input, which we've really very much appreciated in the development of this document and ongoing management. Internally, we're working with our wildlife enforcement, um, our fishery scientists, and our permitting program to uh, increase our knowledge about the program and the functionality of the network. So it's all being pooled together. And we were fortunate that the Ocean Protection Council funded three independent science groups to provide objective information to help in the evaluation. One was a group that uh, helped develop performance objectives uh, to test is the network working as it was designed. 
Another group looked at the potential for MPAs to show some resilience or be resilient to climate change. And the third group is taking all the information that was collected for each of the core habitats that were being monitored to inform this decade of management review and integrate that information uh, to learn more about the um, network at meeting the goals of the Marine Life Protection Act. We know that all this information is probably gonna result in more gaps and uh, additional questions that we're gonna need to answer, but that's a good thing. Um, we'll be, this will also help refine our funding uh, for monitoring strategies moving forward to be cost effective. And ultimately it's going to result in adaptive management recommendations uh, for the Fishing Game Commission. So um, we're, we're working hard on this now and uh, we really appreciate these webinars there uh, to keep the public informed and engaged moving into 2023. If you wanna learn more about the Decadal Management Review, this slide shows a screenshot um, of our landing page. I recommend you check it out. I know AJ just, I think he just posted the link to it. So you don't have to worry about copying it down. There's also, um, you can send us emails. We try to respond within 48 hours. Uh, you can ask questions about the DMR, the Decadal Management Review or MPAs in general. We just look forward to seeing input from you all. Um, I saw a question pop up in the chat while I was speaking and in March of 2023, probably just before the MRC meeting, which is a subgroup of the full commission, we anticipate a, um, a symposium where we'll be discussing each of the pillars of the program. Uh, hopefully we'll have the scientists there to discuss, uh, talk about their research. Department staff will be there with OPC and it'll be open to the public to receive and to be engaged and to ask questions. So we're still working on the details of that. So definitely say dialed in by checking out this webpage or going to the Ocean Protection Council's MPA site. Um, so with that, I just want to thank you all for your time. And once again, Henry and Natalie, great job. We really appreciate it. And I'll just pack, pass the mic back over to, to Mike. Thanks, Steve. Um, and thanks to everybody in the audience for being here today. Um, obviously, thank you so much to Dr. Lowe and Dr. Wool for joining us. You know, we really appreciate you taking the time to share your team science. Um, we know it was a team effort. And it's really our hope that these types of informal discussions are going to help make the science more accessible, um, make the science informing the decadal review and our MPA monitoring and evaluation program in general um, accessible, understandable, um, transparent to anyone who's interested. So as a reminder, um, the full long-term monitoring reports are available online on California Sea Grant's website, which we're posting in the chat now. Um, and as Steve noted, more information on the decadal review can be found on CDFW's DMR webpage, the decadal management review webpage also posted in the chat. Um, recordings of this meeting and future meetings like this are gonna be posted to OPC's webpage and linked on the DMR page as well. Um, AJ will post that in the chat right now. Um, and our next Ask the Researcher webinar will be tomorrow, Friday, June 24th, um, again from 12 to 1 p.m. using the same Zoom link. So if you're down to uh, spend your lunch hour with us again tomorrow, you can hear some more about um, Sandy Beaches. So uh, and that will be Dr. Jenny Dugan from UC Santa Barbara um, tomorrow. So if you have any additional questions or comments that we didn't get to today, um, please email that MPA management review at wildlife.ca.gov email address that Steve noted, um, and a department staff member will gladly respond. So with that, I'm going to wrap us up. Thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate having you all here today and have a great rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Bye.